Let's begin by looking at the different types of radiation. And the three radiations that you need to learn about are called alpha, beta, and gamma. Now, alpha is essentially a helium nucleus. It has two protons and two neutrons. It has no electrons because we're talking about the nucleus itself. Beta is a fast moving electron and gamma is a high energy electromagnetic wave. Now, where do they come from? They come from unstable radioactive elements. Where will you find these? Normally the bottom two rows of the periodic table. You will find things like plutonium, uranium, strontium, a whole bunch of EMs amongst other things. These elements are unstable. Now, what does that mean? It basically means that these elements will decay and form something else. They will turn into another element whilst giving out either alpha, beta, or gamma. Ionization. What is ionization? Radiation is dangerous because it ionizes atoms. For example, let's say we had alpha, beta, or gamma. In this case, you're going to see an alpha particle come in and hit an atom. What it does is it knocks off an electron. This makes the atom ionized. It's lost an electron. It has become positively charged. Ionization in general in chemistry would mean loss or gain of electrons. Quite clearly here, we're only losing and not gaining anything. So why is it dangerous? Well, because you, I, and everyone else is made up of billions and billions of atoms. And if something is coming in and knocking off our electrons, surely that cannot be a good thing. Alpha radiation, we're going to learn, is the most ionizing because it has a charge of positive two and also it's the slowest. Incidentally, you are supposed to be aware of the summary of alpha, beta, and gamma. So you need to know what they are. You need to have an idea of their relative masses. You need to have an idea of their charge. And you need to have a very good idea of their penetrating capabilities and also how much they ionize. So let's go through them one by one. Alpha, as I've told you, is a helium nucleus. It has two protons and two neutrons. It has no electrons. This is not the helium that you might take from a balloon, breathe in to talk in a funny voice. A helium nucleus doesn't have electrons. We have changed the nature of helium in this case. Beta is a fast moving electron and gamma is a very high energy electromagnetic wave. It's a light wave that we basically cannot see. Alpha has a mass of four. Beta you can pretty much ignore. It's so small that we think of it as zero and gamma has no mass. The charge of an alpha particle is positive two. The charge of a beta particle is minus one and gamma has no charge. Alpha will not travel through six centimeters of air. In fact, if you put paper in its way, it will be stopped immediately. Aluminium, on the other hand, will not pass through three millimeters of aluminium. Sorry, beta, on the other hand, will not pass through three millimeters of aluminium. And gamma is very difficult to stop. It will only be greatly reduced by lead. Alpha is the most ionizing, beta is in between, and gamma is the least ionizing. That might make it look like the alpha is the most dangerous. It certainly is if it was inside our body somehow, whether we drank contaminated water or ate contaminated food. However, because alpha doesn't even travel through more than six centimeters of air, 
then from outside the body, alpha is not too dangerous at all. However, even though gamma is the least ionizing, it will penetrate most things. It'll penetrate through my body, it'll penetrate the wall behind me, and probably even the wall behind that. It basically pretty much passes through anything. You would need a really big, thick uh, lead block along with thick concrete to stop gamma. So, how does blocking radiation help us figure out which type of radiation is coming from an actual source? Later you're going to see, and from my book you will see, radioactive sources tend to look like small T's. They're made of metal, and it's normally um, an unstable radioactive element. Now, as I said, these unstable radioactive elements will give off alpha, beta, and gamma whilst changing into something else. So let us suppose we have a Geiger-Muller tube, which is a radioactive detector on the right-hand side. Suppose we just had a piece of metal out over here, which had either alpha, beta, or gamma. Well, what you could do if we ignore background radiation, we could point our Geiger-Muller tube to the radioactive substance. And let's say, for example, it was alpha. Let's say the Geiger-Muller tube had a count rate of 100. You'll understand what that means very shortly. But let's say it has a count rate of 100 and I put paper in the way. Well, if there's no background radiation, basically the alpha will drop down to zero. The reading on the Geiger-Muller tube will read zero because that's telling me that the radiation being given off by the source is alpha because the paper would have stopped it. Likewise, let's suppose it was beta. If I put paper in the way, there'll be very little effect. But if I put three millimeters of aluminum in the way, again, if we ignore background radiation, the reading in the Geiger-Muller tube will drop down to zero. So that would tell me that there is beta. Now you've got to do the paper first before you do the aluminum to make sure it's beta, because remember, if it's alpha, it would be stopped by paper. So that means, Let's say I jump straight to the aluminium. Well, it could have been alpha and not beta. So you've got to do it in order. Paper first to check if it's alpha. If it's not alpha, put aluminium in the way. If it drops down to zero, if we ignore background, then it's beta. If it goes through aluminium and there is no background, then you know it's gamma. Even if you put a big, thick lead block in its way, it would only be greatly reduced. Now, in all of these examples, I've said ignore background radiation. You're going to learn there is something called background radiation and it's always there. Later and now you will learn that background radiation comes from radioactive rocks, radon gas, cosmic rays from the sun. So it's already there, it's present all the time and it has a count rate of anything between 18 and 22. So, when we actually do these experiments, if we assume my um, pointer here is a Geiger-Muller tube, you would always point the Geiger-Muller tube to the room first. Why? Because you want to know what background radiation is. Let's say, for example, it was 20. Let's say I now point it at the metal source, and let's say this metal source was giving out alpha. If I now put the Geiger-Muller tube in front of the alpha source, and let's say it reads 100 counts per second or per minute. If I put paper in the way, the Geiger-Muller tube should only pick up 20. Now, why is it picking up 20? Because of background radiation. You have to understand that there is something there, and that something is background radiation. So alpha will not penetrate paper, beta will not penetrate aluminium, and gamma will be greatly reduced by lead. And again, just a summary, alpha doesn't penetrate paper or six centimeters of air, remember. Beta will pass through paper and your skin, but will be stopped by 
three milliliter, sorry, millimeters of aluminium. So let's just do that again. Um, alpha will be stopped by paper or six centimeters of air. Beta would pass through the paper and your hand actually, but would be stopped by three millimeters of aluminium. And whilst it looks like gamma is being stopped by lead here, it would only be greatly reduced by lead. So let's have a closer look at the Geiger-Muller tube. The Geiger-Muller tube is the most popular radioactive detector. How does it work? Well, inside the tube, there are noble gases. The noble gases in this case are argon and halogen. Now you're taught in chemistry that noble gases are unreactive. In essence, in general, that is true. However, firing alpha, beta, and gamma at the Geiger-Muller tube, or using it to detect radiation, is like firing a rocket launcher at a bulletproof glass window. The bulletproof glass window might be bulletproof, but it's not rocketproof. So whilst noble gases are in general unreactive, in the case of alpha, beta, and gamma, the noble gases will ionize. So what happens? The positive ion will go towards the cathode. The negative electron will go towards the anode. When that happens, the Geiger-Muller tube will make a little noise and register this interaction as a count. On the next page, you're going to see a kind of rough idea of what that looks like. So here's a typical example of what you might see in my book on the left-hand side. Notice that the radioactive source looks a bit like a T. Here's a Geiger-Muller tube connected to a counter, as will be shown on the next slide. Now the sound here, however, is slightly exaggerated. So we have alpha or beta particles coming in, ionizing the gas. The positive ion goes towards the um, cathode. The negative electron goes towards the anode. And you hear this little click. Not quite like that, but the idea is exactly the same. And it registers a count on the counter. Other ways of detecting radiation. Well, another way of detecting radiation is using photographic film. Now, whilst the photographic film will not tell you whether it's alpha, beta, or gamma, the photographic film will turn black in the presence of radiation. So someone in a hospital who works in an X-ray department what might be wearing one of these. Someone definitely working in a nuclear power plant would definitely be wearing one of these. So photographic film will turn black in the presence of radiation Therefore, that basically means get out of where you are. Cloud chamber is another way of detecting radiation. Now, generally, when this comes up, you'll really only be asked, if asked, what other ways are there of detecting radiation? How does the cloud chamber in principle work? Well, it's a little bit like a plane going overhead when the skies are blue. Sometimes it leaves a cloud in behind it. Well, that's kind of the essence of how a cloud chamber works. If alpha particles are passing through the cloud chamber, we get a thick straight line cloud. Fantastic, we can see that there is alpha, but it doesn't tell us how much, like the Geiger-Muller tube. If we get thin wavy lines, we know it is beta. Again, it doesn't tell us how much beta. All we know is that there is beta. And last but not least, if it's thin wavy broken lines, so thin wavy lines with spaces in between, then you can be sure that it is gamma. So alpha, thick lines, beta, thin wavy lines, and gamma, thin wavy lines, but broken in between. 
a little bit like a dotted line. So here we go with alpha, the thick lines, straight, beta, thin wavy lines, and even though it's not shown, gamma, thin wavy but broken lines. And here's a more realistic overview of what that looks like. 